Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Emma Humphreys and I'm the Chief Education Officer of iCivics, a nationwide civic education organization founded by retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor iCivics is committed to reimagining civic learning for all students and today reaches over 9.5 million students a year. I am pleased to be the moderator for today's Commonwealth Club program, Educating for American Democracy, a significant new history and civics initiative involving a diverse collaboration among over 300 academics, historians, political scientists, K-12 educators, district and state administrators, civics providers, students, and others from across the country. Educating for American Democracy, or EAD, launched earlier this week with leadership from iCivics, Arizona State University, Harvard University, Tufts University, and Circle. Today's program is part of Creating Citizens, the Commonwealth Club's new civic education effort, which iCivics helped launch this year. We are in a critical moment now for civics and history education after a difficult year of cascading crises that tested American democracy. The EAD initiative addresses this critical moment with a new framework and plan to improve history and civics education in schools nationwide. It demonstrates that an ideologically, demographically, and professionally diverse group can agree about history and civics content, as well as pedagogy. This detailed consensus presented in a broad roadmap allows states, localities, and educators to assess and reprioritize their own approaches and will encourage investments in civics and history at all levels. I'm so glad to be joined today by several people who are actively involved in shaping the initiative and funding its creation. Paul Carice, founding director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University, who served as a principal investigator and executive committee member of EAD. Kent McGuire, the education program director for the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, which helped to fund EAD and Michelle Herzog, the History Social Science Coordinator for the Los Angeles County Office of Education and past president of the California Council for the Social Studies. Michelle co-chaired EAD's Political Science Task Force and served on the EAD Executive Committee. And I should add that I myself served as the co-chair for the EAD Pedagogy Task Force as a member of the EAD Executive Committee and as editor of the Roadmap Report and Pedagogy Companion. An important housekeeping tip before we get started with Paul, Kent, and Michelle, if you have a question for the panel today, please use the YouTube chat feature. Questions asked there will be submitted to me through the program, throughout the program rather, and I'll try to answer as many, or ask rather, as many of them as I can. So now, turning to my panel, and I could not think of a better group to bring together to make an urgent call to action for new approaches to history and civics education in this country. Uh, so with that, I wanna begin by asking Paul uh, to discuss the impetus for EAD. Why, why do we need EAD now? What is it about this moment that warrants the attention and investment in this initiative? Thank you, Emma. And first of all, thanks to the Commonwealth Club for convening this uh, conversation uh, and to everyone who's viewing and participating. And I'm delighted to be on the panel with Kent and with uh, Michelle and having you uh, mercilessly grill us with these difficult <laughs> questions you're gonna pose. Um, I'll start by saying that it was the federal government, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Education Department that said there ought to be a comprehensive study of public K-12 schooling about civics and history education, but then citizens responded. All of these different institutions uh, responded. Initially a team, as you mentioned, Arizona State University, Harvard, Tufts, iCivics, but then we reached out, you know, we put in for the grant, we were, we were fortunate to receive the grant, and then uh, iCivics as the administrative lead and the rest of us said, well, we need to reach out to many, many people. <laughs> all kinds of people, uh, private sector, public sector, this kind of educator, that kind of educator, and people rallied and responded because even 18 months ago when the grant request was put out, there was great worry among reasonable people about a degree of American polarization that was tipping towards civic disintegration and, and civic dysfunction. 
during the 18 months of the study, it's, it's somewhat extraordinary that this diverse team of people, philosophically, ideologically uh, diverse and experientially diverse, stuck together as the civic disintegration really unfolded before our eyes throughout a very contentious national election, the, the post-election uh, contentiousness. So we have a stronger case than we did 18 months ago to say, for goodness sakes, we ought to take seriously one component of our polarization, the cause of it, one component of our civic disintegration that, that not as many Americans know about or appreciate our history, our civic principles, our ideals, have some perspective on our failings, uh, what they have been, how we have tried to remedy and address them. And I'll just finish with this thought that uh, my father began his public school teaching career as a history and social studies teacher in 1956 mm -hmm. in New York State, the year before Sputnik. And I grew up learning that, well, Sputnik brought a big, that crisis, the national government's response brought in a big infusion of funding to uh, public schools, among other kinds of educational funding. But over the decades, the funding stream and the priority shifted to STEM. And that's great. Absolutely essential for modern life, for American life, to have excellent STEM education and STEM funding. But between the national security crisis rationale, which continued to the Cold War, then the competitiveness, industrial economic competitiveness rationale in the 1980s, slowly and steadily, th those took priority in the public schools. There are problems that we in the history, political science, civics community caused for ourselves in that we couldn't come together and deliberate and work out what a national consensus approach would be. That's what this report has tried to do. But at the end of 60 plus years of this, we are in bad shape in public schools, independent schools, in American civic culture generally, in terms of knowing our history, knowing our civic principles. And I'll just finish with this, knowing how to debate and disagree while being common Americans, common civic friends across all of these diverse perspectives and, and points of view. Thanks so much, Paul. You know, I have to say as a former American history teacher, I loved teaching about Sputnik. I found that my students, I had their full attention when I talked about this satellite that you could go outside and actually see it orbiting and how that led to this sort of nationwide, well, freak out. Uh, and now as a civic ed professional and someone who cares a lot about the field of civic education, it's, it's fun for me that that's sort of what we point to as when the tide started to, to turn and when the national mindset started to shift in terms of educational priorities and uh, we got so far away from uh, preparing citizens. So uh, Kent, you know, Paul mentioned reasonable adults could agree that there was this disintegration of uh, America's civic fabric. I think you're a reasonable adult, so I'm gonna assume you agree. And I'm gonna ask you what, what you thought when you heard about this. You heard about EAD probably very early on, probably right after the NEH announced the award uh, for the Educating Ameri for American Democracy program. Uh, what were you thinking at that time? Were you think, did you have high hopes? Well, <clears throat> yes, my hopes were high. Um, and so were Hewlett's hopes more broadly. Um, you have to remember that, you know, we have a program, a program called the uh, U.S. Democracy. It was the Madison Initiative at the time, but uh, that program was and is, um, you know, a, a real declaration that the foundation cares deeply about the integrity of our democracy. And um, uh, it's, a, you know, we had been working um, on trying to improve uh, the ability to uh, agree and debate in the Congress. Um, we've, um, you know, we haven't let go of that concern, um, but we're even more focused right now through that program on um, um, election integrity um, and on the um, and strengthening governing institutions across the country, and of course the the, the little foundation I run, the the education program, um, has taken. Um, for quite some time, engaged citizens as the overarching goal for our work. Uh, now we 
talked about that now and again um, as um, an exercise in helping young people learn deeply. But what, what do we mean by that? We, we mean their ability to listen, uh, to uh, argue, uh, to debate, uh, to consider facts uh, and get good at discerning fact from fiction um, and to use the, uh, these competencies uh, to solve problems uh, in their own backyard and in the world more broadly. So um, I don't know how um, optimistic I was at the outset uh, because clearly uh, uh, we knew uh, I knew this was going to be a daunting challenge, and I expect you'll uh, report that it has been, you know, at times. But um, but certainly, I was uh, I was really very hopeful, and took that uh, signal um, as an opportunity to start to make some modest tactical bets, uh, you know, in various parts of the field, uh, so we could do our part. Um, and so that we'd be better uh, prepared to take advantage of EAD uh, as it emerged. Oh, well, I'm glad to know you're betting on us. I certainly wouldn't want to know that uh, Kat McGuire was betting against us. So thanks for sharing <laughs> that. I, uh, I have to turn to Michelle now. And this is so Michelle is a lifelong social studies educator, teacher, trainer. I know this because I met her almost two decades ago. We were in Washington, D.C. for a We the People event. And we both snuck out to attend a political protest. Uh, that's an aside. That's right. You remember. I forgot yes. about that. Yes. <laughs> it was a while ago. Well, you, in, you know, in your role in the National Council for the Social Studies, the California Council for the Social Studies, and just overall engagement in, the, in this field, you've seen a lot of efforts come and go, a lot of efforts uh, try really hard and, and fail. So when the folks reached out to you, the EAD leadership reached out to you, what, those 18, 19, 20 months ago, what made you think, all right, this one has some promise. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, thanks, Emma, and thanks to the Commonwealth Club. It's just a real honor to be included in this conversation. You know, um, when I was a little girl, I just aspired to be a classroom teacher because those men and women were my heroes, right? They impacted my life every day, and I achieved that goal. So when I became a fifth grade teacher and uh, my love of history, boy, I could have taught history all day to those fifth graders. They got kind of got short shrifted on math and everything else, but boy, they came away with that. So in my new role, when I moved to the Los Angeles County Office of Education, we serve as sort of a regional support center, like many states have, to work directly with teachers to help them be really effective. Um, so yeah, I'm not with students anymore, but they're always in my mind because, you know, if we're talking about an, educating an entire generation for adulthood, that's where the rubber hits the road, are in those classrooms every single day. And those teachers who are working so hard to try to get the great content knowledge and ideals and principles across into the minds and hearts of five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 13-year-olds, high school kids. Who wants to do that every day, five days a week? I mean, it is the hardest, I'm convinced, one of the hardest jobs. So um, the more I taught and the more I worked with teachers and my love of history really solidified for me the importance that there are great lessons when we study history. But what is the point in learning them if we can't help kids connect those complexities, those issues, those principles of the past to what's happening in the world today? Whether it's you know, two centuries ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, or even you know, 20 years ago, which is before a lot of these kids were even born. Those complex issues and principles seem to be recurring. And that's where civic learning really takes a stronghold. Let's empower kids to learn about those complexities and to empower them to look at them in today's context, um, to take action, to have agency, to be civically engaged. So I, I guess I was invited to be part of the work just to kind of provide that practitioner lens. I don't have the deep content knowledge of history like Paul and the other academics do. But what I was hoping to bring to the work was the reality of how do we help teachers translate that into classroom lessons and inspiration for kids to make it come alive and make it real for them. 
Yeah, thank you. And I'll say you did it. You did that very well. And it's why I have such a sanguine view of it's one of the reasons why I have such a rosy view of the, the, the success of this program is because it's always had that practical lens. It's always included educator voices and uh, teacher educator voices uh, to, to keep it as practical as possible. So let's sort of shift to brass tacks, what what EAD is, what the roadmap is. Paul, I'm hoping I can lean on you and I, and I can you know chip in as, yeah. as needed just to talk about what is EAD? The core of the Educating for American Democracy initiative is this roadmap. And we chose that concept because the American constitutional principle of federalism means that education policy and actual teaching is happening in the states, in, in localities, DC, territories, tribal nations. So we did not want to produce a national curriculum and have a, a dog cat fight about imposing some national curriculum from Washington DC. We did want to propose a national framework, national guidance, because we are all Americans. We are one constitutional democratic republic, but in 50 states and other uh, governing authorities. And so the roadmap metaphor and the actual design and content of it is meant to guide uh, and be, be a provocation in a constructive way for debates that now have to unfold in 50 states and other governing authorities and eventually down to districts and, and teachers, folks who have to design their own curricula, design their own uh, standards. So the roadmap is our argument that here are the essential categories, themes, areas of content and knowledge, but also civic virtues for an excellent civics education and an excellent history education for all American learners. And then we, we designed it in terms of themes, major themes that, that are expressed as statements, but really as questions. And then under those themes are major questions, so to speak, and then more particular questions, all meant to be thinking about professionals like Michelle and the teachers she's trying to support and guide. Where is the rubber really going to hit the road in a, in a classroom or in a particular district? But again, we didn't, that, our job was not to design a curriculum. So uh, the themes were designed as questions. And then one other item that's a crucial innovation uh, Danielle Allen, among others in the, in the leadership team, came up with this idea, uh, design challenges for teachers, but also for students and for anybody else, any other stakeholder concerned with civics education and, and history education, design challenges. What are the major points of paradox or disagreement or complexity about preparing young people to be informed, and engaged citizens? to have the civics and history knowledge, but also the civic virtues to be informed and engaged American citizens. So there are five design challenges baked in among the seven uh, themes. And then just one last point, as Kent was saying, right? Hewlett Foundation is concerned about why has Congress become dysfunctional? Why has our larger political culture become dysfunctional? And again, we, we wove that into the formation of these themes, these major questions, sub questions, design challenges, to emphasize that everybody, I'll put it this way, every person who seriously reads this roadmap and then the accompanying report, everybody should have some difficult moments, right? I'm an intellectual conservative, constitutional conservative, and I was working in this team of, of people and I had my difficult moments where I had to swallow and say, are we really gonna put that phrase in the report <laughs> or in the roadmap? But there are some phrases I'm sure colleagues from a different philosophical persuasion had to swallow and say, really, that's gotta be in there? Because that's what an American civics and history education for the 21st century requires, to know that range of viewpoints and to be able to intelligently discuss, debate, disagree in, in a civil way. So that's, that's in a nutshell, I think, what's, what's no, in That's the, brilliant what, and it, it provides uh, a perfect segue into sort of the, the, what I really wanna talk about. And it matches with the audience questions that are coming in. I have, I have three of them right now in my chat and they're all really along the same theme, which really get to the spirit of the project. So I'm gonna share some of these questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to talk about 
talk about what she viewed as the spirit of the project throughout the process. But I want um, Paul and Kent to be thinking about these as well, because this really gets to the heart of this project and ultimately its success is how we grapple with um, what I'm about to read to you in these questions. So the first one is, is the intention to indoctrinate students into a specific political economic dogma or is it to teach non-bigoted, truly diverse range of philosophies and policies? Why do we, another question, why do we think we only need to teach one side of history? Let's get the truth, all sides, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, and the last one is, are the facts actually just PC dogma or truly broad view of actual facts? So you can see the three first questions I got here are really sort of getting at this. What are we trying to do here? What kind of teaching, what kind of presentation of, of civics and uh, American history? So Michelle, I'd love for you to talk about what you experienced in terms of the, the spirit of the project and, and how we worked through some of these things. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Yeah, those are great questions. And those are the kinds of questions that classroom teachers are confronted with every day. I think this group went into this wide-eyed, right? We are all very much aware there is virtually no topic or issue in current society that hasn't been politicized in one, some way or another, um, where there's some type of ideology uh, perspective that's interpreted from that. And that makes the work hard because our role as classroom teachers is to present information to students and let them come up with their own conclusions. I saw a great article in Washington Post a while ago from a teacher who said, it's not our job to have kids love America or hate America, but to understand it and understand the history. And I, I think that's kind of the spirit that this group came together with. Um, and very intentionally knowing that you have to bring all voices when you're developing documents like this. Very intentional in bringing people from different ideologies and also different stakeholders. Yes, there's a lot of higher ed thinking in this, but like I said, there were teachers, um, practitioners, textbook people, uh, policy makers, all with that shared spirit that we're not pushing a ideology. We're trying to find a way to get kids to think, to inquire, to look at different perspectives, and at the end of the day, come up with their own conclusions. So uh, Paul, I don't know if you'd agree with that, but that's the sense I got, this shared sense of helping young people understand all aspects of our American history and give them voice to try to address some of the issues that still exist today. Yes, and again, you know, this gets back to the fundamental point that Kent made, which is that a, a civics and history education has to reflect the reality of being a free people who need to govern, which means you've got to hear other people and argue with other people. It's not gonna be, you know, kumbaya, but you need to learn the civic virtues on the basis of certain knowledge. Uh, and the, the questioners are asking about facts, right? So let me just address that. Uh, one metaphor I use in teaching and thinking about civic education is that for a citizen, for a student, for an educator, trying to figure out what facts are, what the truth is, what your, your policy views are, is something like being a juror in a trial. It's not a perfect analogy, right? But you want to hear multiple sides and then you have to make some judgments, but you want to test out, is that, do I, am I persuaded that that is solid, reliable information? I'm hearing another point of view and I'm hearing a third point of view. And so that, that was again, baked into the, the, whole idea of inviting, you know, let me put it this way. If I, if I have any conservative friends out there listening, put it this way, a bunch of liberals in the Northeast, where I was a graduate student in Boston, a bunch of liberals in the Northeast reached out to fly over country in Arizona at Arizona State, and I'm an intellectual constitutional conservative and said, if we're gonna have a comprehensive account of what's going well and not going well in civics and history education, we have to have some philosophical intellectual diversity. And then, you know, we, as Michelle has talked about, we have to pull in a range of people who care about and have expertise about civics and history learning. And then we have to have these hard conversations among each other. And then all the people we pulled in, uh, you know, like, like the Hewlett Foundation, other foundations, sounding boards, private meetings we had with people, you know, here, here's a draft. Please give us your candid feedback. I .e. tear it to pieces and tell us what, you know what's that. Would, that's all part of what has to happen in a classroom with, with students. You know, grade level appropriate, but that's what has to happen. Ed, please. I would just add that I think 
um, these design challenges uh, were contemplated with these kinds of questions in mind, that indeed um, it was easy to anticipate that um, folks uh, trying to take this roadmap and use it uh, would come up against questions like this um, and hopefully wouldn't view that as a moment to, oh, I guess we can't do this, but rather, ah, um, here are some interesting challenges that we need to confront as we figure out how to maximize the framework, um, the guidance and the advice that uh, that is tucked within the, uh, you know, the roadmap. I do think that the adults have to learn to get better at this stuff. <laughs> right. Uh, um, you know, if there's any hope for the kids to do it, uh, it, it uh, you know, I'm even more, I might even be optimistic, you know, uh, Emma, uh, beyond hopefulness. If we could get some shining examples of what happens when the adults do this well and behave in that way. And so, uh, I'd also commend to people, you know, the work on pedagogy, uh, you know, this guidance, specific guidance to educators, uh, because I think there, too, um, are some insights about uh, how to tackle some of these design challenges and to sort of bring uh, this stuff to life, you know, in schools and, uh, and classrooms. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for mentioning that document. So folks, if you're thinking, wow, those design challenges sound wonderful, you're right, they are. They're my favorite feature of this whole initiative. If you'd like to see them, if you'd like to download the report, you can go ahead and go to www.educatingforamericandemocracy.org and click download the roadmap and you will see those design challenges on page four. They, they're right there front and center. Um, and they really get at that one question about, you know, do we need to teach only one side of history? Absolutely not. In fact, Design challenge number two is called America's Plural Yet Shared Story. How can we integrate the perspectives of Americans from all different backgrounds when narrating a history of the U.S. and explicating the content of the philosophical foundations of American constitutional democracy? And how can this more plural and more complete story of our history and foundations also be a common story, the shared inheritance of all Americans. It's, it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's poetic, but I think more than anything, it's exactly what we need to sort of cut through the noise, get past the, the history wars and the culture wars and, and have the kind of productive history education and civics education that, that our kids deserve. Um, and thank you, Kent, for bringing us into pedagogy. That, that's an important uh, critical component of this entire initiative. Um, and I, I wanna go back to something that you tweeted during the National Forum on Tuesday. Uh, you wrote, it's difficult to imagine getting this right if we do not address the issue of student agency and power. How will we ensure that students are involved in decision-making in schools? How do schools become more democratic in their design? And I'd really love to talk about this, what happens in the classroom, what happens in the schools, and I invite the entire panel to join in. Uh, but Kent, why'd you ask that question? And, and what is it about EAD that gives you some hope that we, we might get this right? Well, the first thing I wanna say is that it's a rare event when Kent tweets something. Uh, so, you know, that's and the fact uh, that a tweet of mine has now come up, you know, in a session, my uh, my communications uh, officer, uh, she might lose her mind. I mean, she, uh, there's no telling, you know, you know what praise she will heap on me to see if she could get me to tweet more than once every six weeks or something like like that. But here's what was on my mind. Um in, in large measure, um, I realize that the roadmap points squarely at history and civics and social studies. Um, and there is obviously so much catching up to do uh, in that curricular space. But um, I've always thought of schools as among the few or maybe the remaining 
democratizing institution in the country. And I tend to think of democracy as a verb, you know, something that you do, not just something that you study. And so, um, you know, we have a, a line of emerging line of work at Hewlett uh, on student voice and agency. And uh, part of what motivates that, uh, that line of work is the premise uh, that if we can get kids' voice in the game, if we can get them to be meaningful actors, making consequential decisions, doing work that's worth their while in schools, then the prospects of them becoming fully engaged citizens go way up. It, you know, in my opinion, but that's much more likely to happen in schools that understand themselves as playing a role in helping in, in enabling that kind of student work. So um, that's what was on my mind when I made that tweet. Okay, and by the way, and I'm going to uh, do one better for your communications director, folks. That is at CK McGuire. If you'd like to follow uh, Mr. Kent McGuire on Twitter at CK McGuire, M C G U I R E. Uh, I'm sure there will be more brilliance to come. Um, I think this is an important point. It's one that I want to stress. It's stressed in the pedagogy document. You know, I often, I, as a sort of teacher of democracy, I have to grapple with the fact that we're trying to teach kids to be citizens in a constitutional democracy in institutions, schools, that usually aren't run very democratically. And so I think your point here, you know, if, if schools don't understand that this is part of their role and that they can't just teach it, they have to also practice it, model it, bring students in, it's never going to quite work out the, the way we, we might have hopes for it. So a big part of the pedagogy companion is, is not just what you should do in the classroom, but that whole school ecosystem, um, student voice, student agency, um, making them feel like they have some control, some direction over, over themselves and their education and, and what they're doing. Michelle, you're an educator. Um, you know what, what good teaching looks like. Um, Talk to us about this. Do you, do you, do you agree? And uh, what, what can schools or teachers or school administrators do to sort of promote this pedagogical principle? Yeah, in, in theory, I, I totally agree. We want to give students voice and agency, but I want to qualify it a little bit because that too has become very uh, politicized in a lot of context. A lot of families or parents or any group may hear that, may get that letter home from school and, you know, their hair will start to stand up. My goodness, what are you doing to my child? Are you leaning them in a particular ideology? Are you turning them into whatever? And next thing you know, the phone calls come to the school and the principal and comes to your classroom. And unfortunately, we've seen a decline because there's a lot of nervousness around that. Now, Hopefully, this roadmap is going to reverse that trend. So yes, I believe in civic student agency, but I would qualify it. Informed student agency. Take the time. Show teachers how to take this slowly. There's an issue they're concerned about. Do the research. Look at the pro and con. Look at the different perspectives. Have a dialogue about these controversial issues in a, in a framework that's civil, and respectful. That's a skill that's been largely ignored. Sadly, we're not seeing it modeled it much in the general landscape, but that's all I'm gonna say about that. And, but that's what kids are watching, right? Yeah. This, is their, this is their environment. People are yelling at each other. They're not listening. They're yeah. not listening for understanding. They're not looking with a respectful and civil lens before they make up their own decision. They're just following like sheep off the cliff. And this is where I think our democracy is in peril. So yeah. yes, civic agency, student voice, but make sure you teachers are taking the time to look at these perspectives, look at it deeply, dialogue, not even debate, but just dialogue to listen before coming up with conclusions. And teachers got to know too, they may come up with a conclusion you personally don't agree with. That's okay, isn't okay. it? If they have evidence to support that, if they've done the work, if they've done the research. So a lot of this is going to require some really intensive professional development for teachers, because I think Kent is right. It comes down to the teachers 
personal mindset about this, any implicit biases they may have about it, trepidation, concern. They want to keep their jobs, right? No one wants to get fired over going out on a limb on this. But I'm really excited that the roadmap has framed these design challenges, these themes in ways that if we can provide some support for teachers, some professional development, we can guide them to that safe place where we can provide informed agency for students. That makes complete sense to me. And all I would say is, you know, another thing that might soften this a bit is, you know, agency in their own learning. Uh, it's sort of not, not about trying to pick the world apart so much as being engaged, you know, uh, learner. I think that gives rise to the kind of motivation uh, that we also want to see a whole lot more of in, uh, you know, in classrooms. Paul, Michelle raises a really good point that it's not just what we teach, but also how we teach that uh, can be contentious. And so I want to ask you to comment on that and, you know, the discussions you participated in um, about pedagogy and about what would be in those recommendations, sort of how far we could go to re recommend cer certain pedagog pedagogies. And then what you're hearing now that now that the report and the companion and the roadmap are out there, what are you hearing, not just about what we're teaching, but maybe how we're teaching as well? I appreciate what Michelle just said uh, about the the complexity of trying to teach uh, in in a very contentious, polarized uh, political environment. But that again, to go back to some fundamental points, the team that put this together thought complexity, uh, different points of view, disagreement are not some sort of a bug. They're a feature of an American constitutional, democratic, republican order. Uh, I mean, just think about it, right? Not to get, not, I don't want to put people to sleep, but you know, I am a political science professor. So you know, three branches of government, that came from states that had three branches of government and the federal government adopts that. And so now we've got federalism. Now we got, you know, here we are at the Commonwealth Club, you know, a private civil society organization. We're talking with a, a foundation officer from a private foundation that went, you know, we're talking about government, multiple grants of government, private sector, public, you know, to, to produce, uh, you know, or prepare students who can walk into 21st century life as informed and engaged citizens. They need to know all of this, but also practice some of this so that they develop my old fashioned conservative phrase, which we worked in the report is civic virtues. Uh, and I will mention one other point. Michelle said rightly, a teacher's job is not at whatever level, K-12, is, is not to tell students to love their country, right? But we did work in the phrase, the civic virtue of reflective patriotism, that we ought to have teachers, you know, standards, curricula, districts, others put in front of students the idea, maybe you should be grateful for being American, with all of our failings and all of our faults and all of our continued struggles, grateful for those foundational principles, uh, the American founding, amendments, reform, struggle, debate, be grateful with the freedom, the equality, the, the, the rights, the agency it does give. So sure, to, to, to practice these involves being a patriot who cares about America, but not giving up your right <laughs> and just you're a thoughtful human being to disagree, to criticize, to be critical of America, to be critical of points in American history, to, to, to criticize the government, to, to disagree with other citizens. So that whole package is what we're trying to get across in, in the report and then, I'm sorry, in the roadmap and then in the report uh, that explains it. So I would just say one other point we have had some conservative critics say this is some kind of action civics agenda coming mostly from liberal progressive people with a few conservatives who are tossed in to give it cover. Uh, and it's all gonna boil down to some kind of action civics or, or transformative agenda. Is it, well, you know, I suppose anybody can read any document and interpret it in any kind of way, but I, I think it's very hard to say the references to civic participation, preparing students for the activity of citizenship. As Kent said, you know, democracy is a verb. I would say constitutional democratic citizenship is a verb <laughs> as well as uh, a noun. 
And it's so to say that this is a major theme, civic participation, to say that another major theme is the Constitution, the Declaration of the Constitution, our, a new form of government, but also to say another theme is what are major issues and, and moments of debate in America's constitutional democracy right now. That's a very complicated, balanced blend, uh, an educational package. That's what we're, we're trying to put forward. Well, you know, Emma, you know, as one of those people that uh, that Paul just, you know, described or probably more progressive and, you know, left leaning, um, you know, one of the things I admire about the about the EAD is, you know, that it finds it is looking for that balance. Right. Um, um, while I think uh, kids have a right to uh, raise questions about and engage, uh, you know, uh, a democracy when it's not representing them well, um, they're not going to engage it effectively if they don't know how the democracy works <laughs> and don't understand the mechanics. So it's not an either or, which is a big part of the discourse that we're trying to push through is, you know, our appetite for you must be this or it must be that. Uh, when in fact, it is uh, necessarily complex, contextual and nuanced. And I thought that the EA did, you know, acknowledged all of that, put it out front, uh, uh, because it, you can only deal with that complexity and nuance if you acknowledge that it's there. That's and so that's that that'd be what I'd say about that. Yeah, and that's precisely what those design challenges do. I, what I what I love most about the design challenges in this report in general is that it's giving me a language to talk about this and to make sense of this. And I'm sharing this language with teachers who I'm finding are really appreciative of it, really happily receiving it. So this idea of reflective patriotism, which comes from Tocqueville, and then the way we bake this in as design challenge number four, civic honesty and reflective patriotism. How can we offer an account of US constitutional democracy that is simultaneously honest about the wrongs of the past without falling into cynicism and appreciative of the founding of the United States without tipping into adulation? I couldn't articulate my civic education philosophy more, more clearly, more concisely than that design challenge does. And I, I know a lot of civic educators across the country um, from red states and blue states and everywhere in between. And what I know is that they want to do the right thing. And a lot of them view that as precisely the right thing and is, is cultivating those reflective patriotism. So I can't help but be cautiously optimistic that we that we might pull this off. Michelle, do you agree? You, you engage with more teachers than I do. You are a teacher trainer. Um, I want you to talk about this a little bit and then maybe talk to us about what we're going to need to pull this off in terms of teacher training, which yeah. you do yeah. best. Yeah, no, you, you're, Kent and Paul are, are hitting on really important points. It's where do you find that sweet spot where you're recognizing and teaching the failings, um, but also the foundations and initial principles that can enable our country to move forward. We've seen that in history too, right? Uh, different amendments that have come forward. The struggles have been hard. The sacrifices have been huge. But if we're gonna really realize those principles of justice, freedom, equality, we have to keep maintaining and giving hope to that and giving agency like we're talking about to every future generation that comes along. So this is the hardest part, right? I mean, you can't please all the people all the time. We know that, right? But finding that, that nice balance, I think the EAD project did a spectacular job in doing that. Um, like Paul said, there's some things he struggled with. There's some things people on the left struggled with. Um, how many debates did we have, Paul, over a single term, right? I mean, it just went on and on. It was exhausting. There were a lot of meetings and discussions. Um, yes. But we're learning our lessons. We're moving forward. These things are posed as questions. This is what I really appreciate. A lot of us uh, teachers are moving toward this inquiry-driven approach to teaching social studies. It's not so much memorizing dates and facts. I don't know about you, but when I went to school, you know, teacher lecture, and I hate to say it in college too, Paul, I'm sure you're not like this, but boy, the professor would get up there and lecture. We never even got to ask a question. Not all the time, but mostly. 
So turning that around, posing questions that kids will spark more questions, curiosity, let's learn more about this. Let's learn more about this perspective. Let's take it all in. Now I'm really confused. That's good. That's good social studies teaching. It's different than teaching math a little bit, but these other subjects are teaching in those ways too. So this brings this right in focus. I think what we're gonna need is um, some, and Emma and I have talked about this too offline, is some really good professional development to get help teachers move this forward. Giving them time, resources to sit down, look at how and what they're currently teaching, take that roadmap. How does it align? How does it not align? How can we stretch? And I'm really excited to say that even though this EAD is hopefully a game changer, we've got a real game changer showing up next week in Congress. I don't know if you're aware, they're introducing a bipartisan bill called the Civics Secures Democracy Act. It's bipartisan. It's going to be, um, it's sponsored by Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, Democrat from Connecticut, Tom Cole, Republican from Oklahoma, Earl Blumauer from Oregon, and on the Senate side too, Democrats and Republicans. If passed, and we're hoping, we're talking $1 billion, $1 billion over five years to states, 95% of that to go to local LEAs, higher ed, nonprofits, to support civic learning. So that kind of funding, I think we really need to get behind because it'll provide the time, the resource, the funding for teachers to get their heads around products like this or other civic learning initiatives that can really get to our um, shared vision and mission for our nation, let alone our young people. Thanks for sharing that. Kent, do you think, it's, do you think that's gonna move the needle? Is that enough? that focus on funding and that providing professional development and, and sort of at all stage, all levels of our, of our federalist system? You know, work? I've been in that federalist system. I can tell you stories about um, how hard it is to push uh, legisl legislation like that through the government. I can, I've got hunches about how far a billion dollars will, will go. Um, but I would say the timing is perfect, and um, it comes when I think there is genuine interest and demand. I don't think people are confused about the need to do something. I do think um, now is also the time for leadership, um, because it matters a lot. Um, how we seize the moment and leverage any infusion of federal support. Um, um, and so I would just say, number one, that the inquiry-based vision uh, for history and civics that is espoused here uh, isn't just good for history and civics. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a good way to think about teaching and learning across the board that certainly how we do think about it, the, say it differently, the, the pivot from breadth to depth is a good way to think about what needs to happen in the country. Um, uh, and the guidance and advice that I see in the roadmap, uh, not a prescription, but um, ways of thinking about what to do. You know, at the end of the day, um, uh, this context matters. And so states are, are going to pick this up and run with it variously, you know, as they should. Um, and I think the, the crafters of the roadmap were um, uh, realized that and anticipated. So I think if we can get a strong dose of leadership, um, you know, to follow uh, this infusion of resources um, and, you know, take thoughtful advantage of the roadmap, then I'm actually, uh, once again, optimistic, Emma, that uh, about the good things that 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 could happen. Yeah, I love I'll this. Just jump in. I mean, I agree with Kent. Leadership really matters. Um, we've seen great leadership at different state levels, superintendent, even principal levels. But I got to tell you why the money matters. 
If I'm doing a training in my office on civics or history or economics, I'll get maybe 50 people show. But when my, co when my English language arts colleague or math colleague or STEM colleague is doing a training in the room next door, they've got room 150 in a waiting list. All right, so why is that, right? I'll tell you why. Because at the local level, more dollars are dedicated to providing the substitute coverage, to providing the support for the training for those subjects than there is for social studies. You can talk to those principals and they believe in what you're doing, but they're being held accountable in their systems to those other subjects. There's more, there's more resources for those other subjects. We all know the dollar you know, equivalent is, they're getting so much more for STEM and those subjects than others, right? This bill is, talking, is only going to talk about 35% of the funding that usually goes to STEM would come to us for social studies. So I hate to say it, but those kinds of things, accountability systems, funding for professional development, having coaches in schools to follow up with teachers, to coach them, to observe, to give feedback, all of that um, can really help if you've got some dollars behind it to help that leadership not be the isolated few, but to really spread and be uh, uh, embraced by all. Yeah, yeah, Michelle was mentioning that sort of ratio of, of funding. So for folks, um, it's 50, it's a thousand to one STEM to civic. So annually, the federal government invests fifty dollars per student uh, for STEM, and for civics, that number is five cents. Uh, so a thousand to one, the investment, a federal investment annually uh, between STEM and and civics. And as uh, Danielle Allen, one of our PIs, has said, uh, you get what you pay for. Um, and so it should be no surprise, those cascading crises that we mentioned earlier, how that they've been going on. We, we have failed to to educate our students for their their roles in our in our constitutional democracy. Paul, I, you know, we sort of shifted into talking a bit about implementation. Um, we referred to the launch on March 2nd. Um, you know, it was a mad dash to the start line. Uh, now the real work begins. So I'm wondering if you could talk to a little bit, of, talk to us a little bit about What's coming next? What's the next phase? Did we just make this beautiful report to put on a shelf, a uh, pretty roadmap, or uh, are there bigger plans? Yes, we did set ourselves a difficult challenge precisely because we decided we could not, should not try to ha have a national curriculum in detail. So that means that this is stage one and it's a major uh, achievement. You know, my, my, be my beard was entirely black when I started this and having to argue with all these people, it's now... Great. So, but it's a, it's a major achievement, but it's only stage one to have the roadmap, to have the report, to have the website with all the additional material uh, on it. So the, the collaborative federalism principle, so to speak, is that 50 states and District of Columbia and other, you know, governing authorities down to local education agencies have got to read this, take it up. Uh, read the roadmap, read the report, look at the website, reach out to experts involved uh, and assess, you know, does this matter? Should we look at our curriculum, our standards, our funding, our support? I'll, I'll include higher education, right? Uh, we have not done a, a good job in public higher education, private higher education about civics and history requirements for all graduates of private and public institutions. We have not done a great job in schools of education with making sure that, well, let me put it this way. I don't wanna blame the schools of education. I'm a political science professor. History departments and my colleagues in history on the lead team said this, history scholars and departments, political science department scholars, we have not done a good enough job to support teacher preparation. We have not done a good enough job from colleges and universities to support teacher professional development. So because it's not a one size fits all national curriculum diktat coming down, the positive side of that is that engagement, debate, local decisions have to be made about the last 10 feet, the last three feet to a classroom. On the other hand, the real challenge is this has got to be debated and, and taken up. Just on your, your with thousand to one ratio about what the federal government spends uh, on, on K-12 uh, STEM versus civics and history. To go back to the original point here, this is really hard to keep momentum alive and interest alive in this. There's a lot of hard conversations and, and work ahead, but let's remind ourselves, right? 
Sputnik, and then the national economic competitiveness issues in the 1980s. They had the advantage of scaring us from a, a foreign entity, right? Soviet Union, the Cold War, authoritarianism, and then America losing its you know, economic competitiveness and our standard of living. And, and that was partly related to a, a national security rationale. Well, you know, I, I'll go back to uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1838, 20 years before civil war is gonna break out. In 1838, he gives this address to, to a Lyceum in Illinois. He's a young man, ambitious. And he says, America will never be conquered by a foreign power. You could have a Napoleon and head of whatever army, they'll never, they'll never take a drink from the Ohio River. If America dies, we will die by suicide. Sure. And what was he talking about? He, the theme of the remainder of that address was education. Education to be a citizen, education to disagree without breaking into violence, education to disagree without breaking into demonizing other people. Obviously the issue of slavery and abolition was, was the engine there. We have our own issues to deal with, with now, but the, the fundamental point is that we could lose the United States of America. We could lose this constitutional democracy. What more evidence do you need than to look around that polarization can lead to a degree of civic disintegration where people don't have confidence in any level of government People don't have confidence in professions. They don't have confidence in this and that and the other thing. So we, there's a, 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 a genuine internally produced crisis that we all have to own up to. Different sectors, different experts, different leaders needing to step forward right now and do this very hard work that the roadmap is calling for. You know, just quickly, um, fear has long been a strong motivator uh, for, um, you know, policy development, uh, you know, public engagement and political action. And, you know, I, I think we should take Paul's, you know, history lesson to, uh, you know, to, to, to heart. And um, I also think, Paul, I'm a recovering dean. So, um uh, so let me just agree with you about uh, that there is a higher education role here. And then let me suggest that I think one of the greatest areas for leverage, that, that's what we do in philanthropy. We're always trying to figure out well, where's the leverage, you know, on, you know, on this on this problem. Um, just imagine um, what might happen if um, a higher education system took a greater interest in civic reasoning and learning and the like as they think about admitting kids in, uh, that the signal that would send uh, back into the K-12 system uh, about the value placed uh, on those very same things. Um, and so I think the more we can connect post-secondary to elementary and secondary, something, by the way, that didn't happen around the common core state standards, even though we thought and imagined that those standards would be a meaningful proxy for what it means to be, quote, college and career ready, unquote. Uh, so I do think in some ways, or at least I suspect that the, um, uh, drafters of EAD and the debates uh, of which I was not a part, you know, that's the other thing we do is we live vicariously, um, must have gone to school on past efforts uh, to provide guidance and send clear signals out uh, into the field about what needs to happen. At least that's my sense of this. So unfortunately, we've uh, reached the point in the program where there's really only time for, for one more question. So I'd like to ask all the panelists to, to think about um, what does success look like and what's sort of one actionable uh, piece of advice or takeaway you'd like to uh, share with the audience? Um, putting you on the spot here, but what does success look like and or what's one thing you want our audience to know leaving today's program? I would say no matter what your background, your philosophical perspective, your sector in American life, everybody has a role to play here. 
whether you are somehow engaged in state level policy debate about about education, federal policy debate about funding and education, whether you are an educator at some level, philanthropist, to try and find this report, spread the word about this report and, and uh, in your network uh, and, and think about, again, the challenge is this has got to now come from the bottom up with support from the top down. Uh, you know, it's not a blame the schools initiative. <laughs> it's, it's that there has to be an ecosystem supporting informed, engaged education in being a citizen, being, being an active citizen. Yeah, I like Michelle. the don't blame the schools part, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of Plus all one. schools, we appreciate that. Um, but yeah, um, I'd like to think that all of us living in this nation are committed to realizing those initial ideals that the founders put forward for everyone living in this nation. And I think everyone living here can probably point to pieces in history where their people were not always guaranteed those rights, where they were denied. But that if we have a shared commitment to move forward and educate young people about what's happened, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and give them the skills and knowledge they need so that hopefully maybe it's a pipe dream that all those ideals from the founders are realized for everyone living in this American democracy. But we can only do that if we're open to putting forth all of those warts and all and aspirations at all in front of students so they fully appreciate the complexities around human behavior, human life, and what we can achieve and not drop out, but to be engaged. Whenever there's a, even if when elections coming up, don't just vote for the person because they have the right letter by their name, but to listen critically and carefully. That's just one example, because it impacts everything we do every day in our lives. And I, I think we are lucky to live in this nation that has those foundations, but we just can't assume they're gonna happen automatically. We have to all collectively work toward achieving them. Well, really quickly, Emma, I think just tactically speaking in the moment, um, uh, an immediate uh, uh, manifestation of success will be is if there is an infrastructure that comes to exist to take responsibility for helping the field take um, full advantage of the guidance that is contained therein. Um, I think, secondly, um, as we watch states and localities go through their own natural process of revising their standards and updating their curriculum, that we see traces of this guidance, uh, you know, in their work. Um, and that um, longer term, uh, we see um, uh, both an integration and a stronger balance between the role that history and civics and social studies uh, play um, in the curriculum uh, together with English language, arts, science, and, you know, and math. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree. We need that infrastructure. I'll say sort of informally, um, my, my definition of success is one day in America before anyone shares a political article on social media, they will first Google it. Uh, to see if it's true before they share a meme or any other sort of post, right? That's that's what I want to see. But formally, uh, we we do have some goals. They're they're in the report, um, and and this is a long game, folks. We're not going to you know resurrect or, or you know bring our constitutional democracy to to full health overnight. It's going to take some time. So we're hoping that by 2030. 60 million students will have access to high quality civic learning opportunities. 100,000 schools will be civic ready, have a civic learning plan and resources to support it. And 1 million teachers will be EAD ready, having received excellent pre and in-service professional development. So, so that's how EAD is sort of defining uh, success, but notice that I said 2030, uh, not tomorrow not next year. Uh, folks, I really want to encourage everyone watching today, first of all, thank you so much for joining us, but to visit www.educatingforamericandemocracy.org. You can download the roadmap, the report, the pedagogy companion. 
importantly, in the upper right hand corner, you can click on take action. And there you will find a series of briefs for all sorts of people, all sorts of roles from students and parents and teachers to higher ed faculty, state legislators, community members. Find that brief that sort of best matches to you and your role, download it and uh, see if you can put some of that into place. So. Sadly, uh, this is all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank all of our speakers today and, of course, the Commonwealth Club, our host for today's program. The club will soon be posting this video along with other civic education resources on its website, www.commonwealthclub.org. I am Emma Humphreys of iCivics, and this special virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is concluded. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.